Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Susan Marks. I'm from the Law Department here at the LSE, and I'd like to welcome you warmly to this event on Pride and Propaganda, LGBT Rights in Russia Today. Uh, this event is hosted jointly by the Law Department, Spectrum, which is LSE's LGBT staff network, and the LSE Student Union LGBT Alliance. The event anticipates LGBT History Month um, next month, for which Spectrum and the LGBT Students Alliance will be putting on many more events. The hashtag tonight, for tonight's event is LSE Russia. There'll be live running commentary, and you're invited to tweet along yourselves. Let me first highlight a few uh, salient facts which render this event extremely timely, not to say urgent. As I'm sure you all know, in June uh, last year, the Russian Duma passed a law banning what it called propaganda of non-traditional sexual relations to minors. The law is said to be necessary to protect, protect children. Uh, the effect of the legislation is that citizens can be fined for um, advocating LGBT rights, taking part in gay pride parades, or for equating gay relationships with heterosexual relationships. Organizations can likewise be fined rather more substantial amounts and can be required to cease operations for uh, significant periods. Foreigners themselves can be arrested, detained, and fined for up to 15 days and deported. As you know, um, another part of the context in which we take up this topic is that at the end of next week, on the 7th of February, the Winter Olympics will begin at Sochi. They focus the world's attention on the state of LGBT rights in Russia and particularly this homosexual propaganda law. The International Olympic Committee has publicly stated that it's fully satisfied that the law doesn't violate the prohibition against discrimination, which can be found in the Olympic Charter, not to mention the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the European Convention on Human Rights, and other pertinent treaties. Uh, moreover, it stated that it will take action against and potentially expel any athlete who breaches the rule against political demonstrations in the Olympic Charter. So the OIC's position on this is apparently not political, but anyone who demonstrates against it will be guilty of a political demonstration and will be expelled. Um, meanwhile, um, Mario Pescante, a senior member of the Italian, um, sorry, senior Italian member of the IOC, has criticized the US for including gay people in its Olympic delegation. As I'm sure you heard, um, as I did on BBC Panorama, the mayor of Sochi announced that there are no gay people in Sochi. Meanwhile, President Putin has said that, in fact, gay people are welcome at the Winter Olympics, but that they should leave the children alone. The um, homosexual propaganda laws uh, that I've just mentioned don't stand alone. Um, since 2006, several similar uh, anti-propaganda laws have been enacted at the regional level uh, in uh, Russia. In June 2012, Moscow banned gay pride parades from the city uh, for the succeeding 100 years after Moscow's mayor denounced them as satanic. In um, 2012, a law was passed targeting NGOs as foreign agents um, and um, subjecting uh, um, human rights NGOs in particular, including those focusing on LGBT rights, uh, to inspection, fines, and in some cases, closure. Well, to uh, talk about these issues, we have uh, an, a stellar cast of speakers tonight. Firstly, and joining us by Skype uh, uh, on the screen, is Ksenia Kirichenka, who uh, uh, is Legal Assistance Program Coordinator for the organization Coming Out in Russia, which provides support services for LGBT people in St. Petersburg. Coming Out is one of the organizations that's been found guilty and fined under the uh, NGO foreign agent law that I mentioned. Ksenia is also a board member of the Russian LGBT Network, uh, 
um, an, NGB, uh, an, an NGO that works for the protection of LGBT rights and the social acceptance of LGBT people across Russia. She previously worked as a lecturer in law at Novosibirsk State University. We're absolutely delighted to have you with us tonight, Kazenia. Can you hear us and see us? Yes, sure. Fantastic. Welcome. Thanks. Our second speaker is going to be Jonathan Cooper, uh, who will be well known to many people here, uh, a barrister with Doughty Street Chambers specializing in human rights law. Jonathan has an extensive history of litigating for LGBT rights. Towards the beginning of his career, he was junior counsel in the Crown against the Ministry of Defence, ex parte Smith, which concerned the ban on LGBT people serving in the UK Armed Forces. He's now CEO of Human Dignity Trust, uh, a wonderful organisation that's helping to mobilise test case litigation to challenge laws and, uh, that criminalise same-sex activity across the world. Jonathan's carried out um, training programs in Russia and Central Asia and many, many other countries on human rights. He's the editor of the Human Rights, uh, sorry, the European Human Rights Law Review, Halsbury's uh, Rights and Freedoms, and numerous books and manuals in the area of human rights. In 2007, he was made an OBE for his services to human rights. Our final speaker, uh, Peter Tatchell, uh, really. Uh, deserves the label of needing no introduction. Of course, world-renowned social activists campaigning not only for LGBT rights, uh, but also for environmental issues and against the Iraq war. From his early days with the Gay Liberation Front, Peter has made an enormous, uh, really unparalleled uh, contribution to the LGBT rights movement in the UK and elsewhere. He was instrumental in national campaigns against Section 28, uh, a law with more than a passing resemblance uh, to the current uh, Russian gay propaganda law, and also against British Age of Consent laws. He's visited Moscow several times to support uh, Moscow Pride, taking part in Pride parades at great personal risk, getting um, punched in the face and arrested for his efforts. We're absolutely delighted to welcome Jonathan Cooper and Peter Tatchell to the stage. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so the plan for tonight is that our three speakers um, will address you for around 15 or 20 minutes, and then there'll be uh, plenty of time for discussion at the end. So, Kazania, can I ask you to kick off? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in the discussion. Uh, I hope that I could contribute to the general discussion and my presentation will be interesting for you and uh, sorry for my accent. Uh, I hope that it's okay for you. And uh, what I would like to do this evening is to tell you uh, about development of the Russian legislation prohibiting so-called propaganda of homosexuality as well, um, as well as its official and unofficial, direct and indirect application, because there are many questions around uh, what is the legislation, is it legal or illegal, is it possible to um, apply this legislation, and so forth. Uh, so I will start with uh, historical perspectives and uh, how this law uh, was created. Um, I would say that uh, there are rather were uh, four waves uh, in developments, in legal developments around uh, no promo homo legislation in Russia. And uh, the first wave was in 2003 and 2006 uh, when two similar bills uh, aiming to amend the criminal code by criminalizing so-called propaganda of homosexualism were introduced in the state Duma. So the first attempt to uh, to ban homosexual propaganda was made in 2003 and 6, and it was about criminal code. Uh, however, uh, all these attempts uh, remained unfruitful, and even governmental bodies in Russia gave negative feedback on these bills. I think that uh, there were three uh, main reasons for this, for doing this, for giving negative feedback. The first was that um, this bill prohibited propaganda um, it was intended to be a crime, uh, so propaganda was intended to be a crime and not uh, administrative offence 
as we have now, and to criminalize such conduct was too much even for Russia, even at that time. The, the second reason was that these bills in 2003 and 2006 uh, said about propaganda in general and not about propaganda among minors. And uh, we, we didn't had at that time, we didn't have uh, all these discourse about vulnerable uh, children and need to protect them. And thirdly, in 2003 and even in 2006, I would say that um, at that time there was no uh, aggressive, negative, anti-LGBT official discourse. Uh, so there were no political will to, um, to punish or to limit LGBT people and LGBT activists. LGBT people were uh, untouchable and invisible at that time for, for the government. But uh, it was not um, it was not something that should be prohibited. Um, but the time is running, and homophobic politicians are creative. Therefore, in 2006, the second wave of no promo homo legislation started. And in 2006, uh, in Rezan, Rezan is one of the cities in Russia. Uh, the first regional law on propaganda of homosexualism among minors was adopted in 2006. Uh, this law established only administrative fines and it did not contain any definition of propaganda. It was only a prohibition of propaganda of homosexualism among minors and no one uh, knew what, what, what is propaganda, what is such propaganda. Uh, there were no public discussions around adoption of this law in 2006 and almost no one even heard about this law. Uh, including politicians, law enforcement officials, and judges. And it was a situation uh, till 2010. In 2010, uh, the Russian Constitutional Court made a decision on uh, this first uh, regional law following the Nicholas Alexeyev's complaint. Uh, at that time, the Constitutional Court stated that uh, propaganda law did not violate the Russian Constitution and instead uh, protects uh, traditional values, family, childhood and motherhood. Uh, the Constitutional Court also created a definition of propaganda, a uh, very vague and inhuman in nature definition, and the Court state, uh, stated that uh, propaganda of homosexualism is uh, public activities aimed at deliberate and uncontrolled dissemination of information capable of harming the health, moral and spiritual development, including by forming uh, misrepresented conceptions of social equality of traditional and non-traditional marital relationships. So it's very vague, very uh, long, uh, crazy definition, but uh, there is a position of the, of the Constitutional Court. Um, and by doing this, by made this decision, the Constitutional Court uh, predetermined basically any further litigations concerning application of the law, because um, it could be abnormal that any uh, regional or uh, regional court uh, in the Russian Federation could uh, go against uh, the Constitutional Court's position. Uh, the third wave of the development, uh, 2011 and 2012, uh, were the years of active regional legislative, uh, re <coughs> sorry, legislative initiatives. Uh, at that time, in 2011 and 2012, about a dozen of the Russian regions, including my city, St. Petersburg, adopted similar piece of anti-propaganda legislation. And uh, in several other regions, such bills were discussed. And in Russia, uh, we have 83 regions, and uh, there were about uh, 10, 12 uh, regional law prohibiting propaganda. Um, these laws um, stated that, um, so these laws adopted social inequality standard established by the Constitutional Court. Uh, and in some regions, not only homosexual propaganda was uh, banned, but also propaganda of lesbianism, bisexualism, and even transgenderness among minors, and it was the case in St. Petersburg, for instance. In some regions, uh, anti-propaganda bills included prohibition of propaganda of homosexuality and prohibition of propaganda of, of uh, pedophilia, and by doing this, um, 
legislative authorities uh, linked to different uh, concepts and reinforced uh, negative stereotypes about LGBT people. And uh, uh, from political point of view, uh, in most cases, these regional laws were uh, initiated by members of the ruling parties, uh, United Russia, and um, we had some unofficial, some unofficial information that uh, the idea of the politician was to test uh, if such laws could be successfully adopted and implemented in regions, and if yes, then to make it national. Uh, it was the idea in 2011, and uh, we uh, at that time we didn't uh, even we, we we couldn't even imagine that uh, it could be possible in Russia to adopt a national law prohibiting so-called propaganda of homosexualism, but it happened. And uh, in some regions, the laws were supported also by religious groups, especially Orthodox groups, and. Uh, there were people, religious activists, uh, who uh, gathered signatures for adoption of uh, regional laws, and after all, they were successful. Uh, the first, the last wave finished in 2000, uh, started in 2013, when the national law prohibiting so-called propaganda of non-traditional sexual relations was adopted by the State Duma. And after that, uh, one of the first regional laws adopted in uh, one of the cities, Arkhangelsk, was revoked. And basically, the rest of the regional laws now uh, do not have any sense, except from probably definitions based on marital relations, marital relations, but not non-traditional sexual relations, and uh, ban on propaganda of transgenderness is in St. Petersburg. And uh, what, I can, what I can tell you also uh, is the application of the law and how the laws prohibiting propaganda of homosexualism are applied in Russia now. Um, uh, the main thing is that it is very difficult to apply the law as such and uh, you know that the first law was adopted in 2006, but since then, cases when persons were found guilty under the law and charged with the administrative fines uh, could be counted on the hand. So there were, uh, there were uh, several, really, there were, I don't know, five, six, seven cases, but when the laws were being in the process of parliamentary discussions, their proponents claimed that homosexual hazard was huge and terrible, and homosexual propaganda was, was widespread, but now we have uh, probably 10 uh, cases when persons were found guilty in um, propagating homosexualism among minors. And most of these cases involved LGBT public activists that were detained during street protests. Uh, therefore, the laws these laws as such uh, have not yet been applied to private sphere, uh, such as family relations, as many of LGBT people were afraid of. It was mostly about uh, LGBT public activities. Apart from that, uh, an official but indirect application of uh, no promo homo legislation take place when authorities prohibit public events in favor of LGBT rights, uh, in advance. Uh, for example, I represented several activists in such cases in St. Petersburg when events were uh, prohibited in advance, and uh, one of these cases uh, already submitted to the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, another example of indirect official application is uh, forced termination of LGBT public actions by police following the complaints made by public in fact, by homophobes. Uh, this was the case, for example, on June 29th, uh, 2013, when the police stopped a gay pride in St. Petersburg um, and then arrested its participa par participants, charging that them not with propaganda but with violation of the public events legislation. Uh, but the reason for, uh, the reason for uh, terminating the pride was... Um, was statements made by public about propaganda. Uh, and what is probably more dangerous is unofficial application of the legislation and its symbolic force, because 
uh, even not being applied legally, this law creates conditions that deteriorate the lives and work of LGBT persons and civil activists working against discrimination. First of all, the laws create a climate of hatred and hate crimes and hate speech are justified by these laws. And radical groups preserve uh, the adoption of anti-propaganda laws as sanctioning violence. For example, uh, in St. Petersburg uh, on May 17th, 12, uh, in May 17th, uh, 2012, uh, there was a rainbow flash mob and one of its participants was attacked by a radical orthodox activist. Uh, the attacker then in uh, court proceedings uh, said that he arrived to the venue because he heard about the event and could not even imagine how it was possible in the city adopted the law prohibited propaganda of sodomy and he, religious activist, came there to check if there was actually such propaganda and he found it, this propaganda, for example, two women kissed publicly and uh, his religious feelings were insulted and therefore he lost control and and, uh, shot at the victim. So this, uh, this is just one example when um, when homophobic attackers uh, justify uh, their acts, their hate uh, crimes by uh, basically by this ban on propaganda of, of homosexualism. Uh, another problem is that uh, homophobic activists ask the general prosecutor's office to examine the LGBT or educational organizations' activities or teachers who are LGBT activists. Um, and uh, they ask uh, the general prosecutor's office to determine uh, whether or not uh, they, organizations or activists, engage in the propagation of homosexuality. Even if law enforcement officials found no violation of the law, uh, the very fact of the investigation could trouble, of course, people and organizations. Uh, another problem is parental rights, and uh, while the law as such has not been used for limiting parental rights of LGBT parents. There is uh, now a legislative pro- proposal in Russia to add non-traditional sexual relations into the list of grounds for annulment of parental rights. And in, uh, in the explanatory note to the bill, uh, its uh, author uh, stated that prohibition of propaganda of homosexuality obviously cover families, and therefore the proposed bill uh, is in the line with the general prohibition of propaganda of homosexualism among minors. Uh, Finally, the law has a large uh, effect on the LGBT community, and uh, my organization coming out, we did uh, an online survey conducted in 2012, and we found that uh, 65% of the LGBT respondents felt that the law gave a green light to homophobic organizations and movements who seek to attack LGBT persons and groups. Forty uh, persons felt that after the adoption of the law, they have to control their behavior in public more carefully. And uh, 24 persons uh, felt that uh, felt the rise of a constant fear of the law being applied to them. So it's a statistic that we get from online survey in St. Petersburg among LGBT people. Uh, yeah. And lastly, uh, after the adoption of the law and uh, trends around it, much more LGBT persons started to think about or choose to ask for a political asylum. For example, if, let's say, in 2010, um, I received uh, three, four, five at maximum um, requests uh, for legal help in asylum cases from LGBT persons. Then in 2013, uh, we had sometimes uh, five, six requests uh, per week, just for one week. And uh, for more and more people, unfortunately, uh, Asylum and going uh, to another country uh, became the only option in this situation. And uh, finally, uh, what about perspectives? Um, About a week ago, 
uh, a bill calls, um, called for a ban on promoting the priority of sexual relations was introduced in the Russian State Duma. Um, so the idea of the drafters was to expand the so-called ban of on gay propaganda to all kind of sex. Um, we had such history, uh, we, we had such discourse in our history, and there was a word uh, that there is no sex in the USSR, and probably it's uh, coming back to that ages, but... Um, for now, there is no um, unified position among uh, LGBT organizations, LGBT human rights organizations. Is it good or bad that the Russian Duma, uh, some of the representatives of the Russian Duma want to um, change uh, homophobia, uh, change uh, propaganda of homosexualism by uh, banning propaganda of sexual relations in general? But uh, me personally, as a human rights activist and human rights lawyer, I think that uh, we cannot say that it's a positive trend because uh, implicitly this ban on uh, propaganda of sexual relations will include uh, also ban on uh, sexual, non-traditional sexual relations because we have already practice of the Constitutional Court, we have already practice of the Supreme Court, we have already attitudes of judges, and uh, just uh, changing the wording of the law would not change uh, application of the law. So, uh, so we should wait probably five, six, uh, seven years to really to, to, to change something in this situation. Great. Thank you so much, Ksenia. We've heard about the wide uh, and deep legal context and its far-reaching social and practical consequences. Jonathan, would you like to take up the story? Well, it's a, it's a great honour to be here and to discuss this extremely important issue. It is really one of the kind of pressing human rights issues of the day. Uh, and I'm delighted to be able to come and, and share some thoughts with you and have a discussion with you and, and with my colleagues on the panel. Um, there is a global perspective to all of this, which I think we have to, to recall, that it's not just Russia that we're looking at. We're looking at a, a, at a, a dramatic change across the globe where we're seeing enhanced criminalisation, increased criminalisation. We're seeing these measures in Russia, which are criminalisation. And I think it's very important that we emphasise at the very beginning that even though the Russians call these administrative penalties, if you actually look at what they are, what these penalties are, and you identify what a criminal penalty is, these administrative penalties are criminal penalties. So we are looking at the application of the criminal law to the gay and lesbian community um, in Russia. It may be that they're not criminalising the simple act of sex in the way that we're more familiar with, but it is definitely the criminalisation of gay and lesbian identity and gay and lesbian um, conduct and gay and lesbian being. Um, I would also like to pay a tribute to the extraordinary organisation that is coming out. It is an outstanding organisation. They do really, really remarkable work. There aren't very many of them there, but they work solidly, and they are one of the most professional groups that I, I've come across. So I, I, I encourage you to find out more about coming out, because they are an organisation of extraordinary quality. Um, but what I want to do, first of all, is just talk a little bit about Russian traditions, if that's all right, as somebody here, a British bloke here in London at the LSE, if you'll allow me just to talk a little bit about Russian traditions that, um, that, the, that the law, the Russian propaganda law, is aiming to uphold. Russia does, of course, have a strong tradition of gay cultural icons. 
Tchaikovsky, Gogol, uh, Mussorgsky, Diaghilev, Eisenstein, just to, to name just a few, and even Tolstoy, the great Tolstoy, confessed to his diary of his own attractions towards men. So it's quite interesting if you are a Russian student and you are studying the Russian greats, how are you going to get around those, those figures and how are you going to get around their own self-professed um, um, homosexuality? In the, 19, in the 17th century, a, a German ambassador uh, arrived in Moscow and felt obliged, compelled even, to comment on, about the, uh, on the amount of man-on-man action that he encountered whilst he was in Moscow. Um, and then there was, of course, Prince Peter uh, Volkonsky, who was um, uh, a companion to Alexander I in the, in the Napoleonic campaigns, uh, one of the most decorated officers of the Russian army, he was well known to be gay and to have many, many lovers. Um, and even the, the Tsar himself kind of got caught up in the slipstream of, of Volkonsky's um, enthusiasm and tearfully proposed that the two of them retire together to their own villa on the Black Sea. And the more romantic story, possibly, is that of Nadashta Durova, a young woman who joined the army, joined the Napoleonic campaigns, and her um, heroism was so acknowledged, she joined as a soldier, as a man, that the Tsar himself rechristened her, giving her his own name, and she lived out the rest of her life in trousers and insisted that her children address her as dear parent. And so there is a very strong, a very rich, a very wonderful um, gay and lesbian tradition in Russia there was, of course, the, the poet uh, Lemontov, who in the 1830s uh, described this, uh, the gay sexual shenanigans in his notorious poem, The Ode to the Lavatory. And in that poem, he described the nightly scenes between fellow military cadets, where he graphically uh, pointed out that here the shirt is lifted, revealing a silky bum and thighs. Hold me, he announced. I am melting. I am on fire. The poetry might not be so great but the sentiment is there Uh, the sentiment is there that there is of course this very strong and rich tradition in Russia that they should of course be proud of you know, they are the, the, the you know, Tchaikovsky, the great po- the, the, the greatest conductor, one of the greatest conductors, Tolstoy, Gogol, I mean, extraordinary characters, all of whom acknowledged their homosexuality, which is a, a rich, wonderful part of that Russian tradition. And so they then introduced these, um, this law, this, this federal law, that you don't need me to, to, to explain it any further. It's been very well described. Uh, but the point about this law is, I think that you're almost certainly committing this criminal, and I think we should call it a criminal offence, this criminal offence, uh, because you are in St. Petersburg and you are being streamed here, but being streamed back to Russia... And so, therefore, in theory, because you are, if you are promoting um, homosexuality as an equal and valid relationship as heterosexuality, you have committed that administrative offence. And so, we are all now complicit in the offence. It is that simple to commit this offence. I'm not sure how you don't commit the offence other than absolutely sidelining uh, the gay and lesbian community and actually just wiping us out. We have to be wiped out because you can't ever discuss us because if you discuss us, you'd have to be sure that, there was, that you were discussing us in any way where children could be or minors could be involved. And that is impossible. It is impossible. I mean, there may be children here, I'm, I'm not sure, but it is impossible for that discussion to happen without um, minors being in some way connected. And so, therefore, it is so easy to commit the offence, which is why the offence in and of itself is unlawful. It doesn't satisfy It doesn't satisfy those requirements for law. For those of you who are from the law department here, you'll be familiar with what they are. But of course it has to be precise. We need to be able to understand what the law is and able to be able to regulate our conduct um, according to it. And of course there are serious penalties um, that go alongside this law, hence why it is a criminal penalty. It is not an administrative penalty, it is a criminal penalty. And it is a penalty that, um, it, as I've already pointed out, it is very easy uh, to commit. 
I'm not going to say any more about it other than uh, to point out that if you want an English translation of the law, you can find it on the Human Dignity Trust's um, website. You can also find an extraordinary article on Huffington Post which compares the, 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 the Russian um, propaganda law uh, and just replaces non-traditional family relations with um, relationships involving a black person and a white person. And once you do that, the very graphic, insidious nature of the law is really, really... It, it shouldn't need to be rammed home just because you compare it if the relationship was one involving a black and a white person, but it really does get, get rammed home. But we've heard the origins of these laws, how they started off in 2003 and 2006, and how they then evolved uh, over, over time. And there's another aspect to it. There's another aspect to these laws um, that comes from the United States, and it comes from the U.S. evangelical movement. Uh, and there is a, a, a particularly viscerally homophobic um, so-called pastor, uh, evangelical pastor in the United States, a chap called Scott Lively. I'm sure some of you will have heard of him. And between 2006 and 2007, he undertook a tour, a, a, a program throughout the former Soviet Union, starting in the east and ending up in St. Petersburg. And what he was there to do was to talk about this international gay conspiracy that he um, described to those who he spoke to. And he lectured at various institutions, universities, churches, conference halls, and he met numerous uh, government leaders um, at various levels of influence. And in October 2007, Scott Lively wrote in an open letter to, the Russia, to his Russian colleagues in which he advocated that Russia should criminalise the public advocacy of homosexuality and the easiest way to discourage gay prides, parades and other homosexual adv advocacy, he pointed out, was to make such activity illegal. His subsequent publications, such as Defend the Family, an activist handbook, uh, published in 2007, and Redeeming the Rainbow, keeping um, dear old Judy away from it, he identified the, the, in detail the need to silence the advocacy of gay and lesbian individuals. I don't want to overbig um, the, the lively in the US evangelical movement and its impact, but after Putin had signed in the anti-propaganda law, Scott Lively stated that, yes, I think I influenced the Russian law. He has further stated that my greatest success in terms of my own personal strategy is Russia. In an open letter to Putin dated 30th of August 2013, he went on to state, as, as a long-time leader, so this is a warning to us all, as a long-time leader in the pro-family movement who toured your country in 2006 and 2007, advocating the very policy you have enacted, I want to caution you not to assume that you have fully solved the problem by the enactment of this law. So he is anticipating further um, developments. And it should be pointed out that Lively played an incredibly important role in what's that now been going on in Uganda. And the Ugandan activists, those extraordinarily smart, brave people, have, are now beginning to fight back. And they have brought a, a, a court action against Lively in the US courts arguing that what he has been promoting uh, is tantamount to a crime against humanity. You may be familiar, I'm sure you're familiar, with the anti-homosexuality legislation in Uganda, and therefore they're bringing a case against him under the Alien Tort Statute. And so there could be significant remedies coming the way of brilliant activists in, in, in St. Petersburg and in Uganda um, if it is established that that is what Lively has been, has in fact um, been doing. So I think we have to look at that role that the, that the US evangelicals have made. But is there a solution to all of this? Well, of course there is. Human rights will prevail. And I think we have to have confidence in the International Human Rights Project, and it will prevail. Uh, we've already heard from our colleague in St. Petersburg about the cases that there are in um, the European Court of Human Rights. They're, they're at the very early stages. I think coming out itself um, is, is, is clearly a victim of these laws. Um, many, many individuals are. It would be it, th those cases will win. There's been a, there's been clear guidance and opinions from all the key institutions at the Council of Europe, the home of the European Convention on Human Rights, which has made it clear that these laws violate the European Convention on Human Rights. 
But I want to propose something here and now, and I think it may be the first time it has been proposed, and this is an appropriate venue um, to, to make this suggestion, uh, LSE being the home of gay and lesbian rights in this country, the birthplace of gay and lesbian rights in this country. But I think what we need is an interstate application to be made against Russia before the European Court of Human Rights. I think we should have a country, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be the United Kingdom, but um, a country should take Russia to the European Court of Human Rights and establish the persecutory nature of these anti-propaganda laws. It shouldn't be left to the extraordinary individuals that that we've been hearing about um, in, in Russia. I think it's the responsibility of our states to protect the gay and lesbian communities as best they can around the world. And one of the most effective ways in which they could do that, they've all denounced these laws, Um, they could bring, and there's nothing to stop them doing it, they could bring an interstate case against Russia before the European Court of Human Rights. You don't have to have a victim under these circumstances. For those of you who've studied these things, Ireland and the United Kingdom clearly established that. You don't need a victim. You, could, you just need to show that the law in and of itself is violative of the Convention. And we've already been hearing about the asylum claims that have been being made as a consequence of this legislation. And so these jurisdictions have a self-interest anyway in, in ensuring these laws aren't on the statute book because, of course, they do create the persecutory environment that would establish uh, or could establish a successful claim in, in asylum. We need to hear more from the Commissioner of Human Rights um, in, in, in Strasbourg, and we need him. He's a Latvian man. He's a, he's a very smart man. He's already spoken out against this, but we need him to be um, supportive of any such interstate application, and we need the Commissioner for Human Rights to be intervening in those in any interstate case that is made. Other countries that could bring it are the neighbours of, um, of Russia, who are clearly vulnerable um, in the context of, of potential asylum claims. But I think it is a solution. I think it's a reasonable solution. I don't think it's, uh, it's too much to ask, and I think we should be looking at that as an option. Should we um, be boycotting Sochi? I don't know. I think we as gay and lesbian people, for those of you who are in the audience who are gay and lesbian, we're such a vulnerable, small community. And I just think these calls for, um, for, for boycotts just don't work. I think we've got to be much more strategic. And we end up just being so let down. I feel so let down by the, by the International Olympic Committee and the absurdity of their, of their arguments. So therefore, we've got to be much more creative in exactly the way that we know how to be creative. We use law, we use culture, and we use morality and human rights to make our arguments. And those arguments win, and we will win. Human rights will prevail, and this is a a fundamental human rights issue. So I bring it back to the global context that I currently work in, um, running as well as the chief exec of the Human Dignity Trust, And it does feel very much that we're under siege. We have Russia last year. At the very end of the last year, we had the Indian Supreme Court doing that extraordinary thing of recriminalizing homosexuality in (laughs) India. You had the Ugandan parliament rushing through the anti-homosexuality bill on the 20th of December. It wasn't core, so of course it can't actually become the law, but it's still, it's still the, the, the legislation was rushed through, creating all sorts of extraordinary offences with life imprisonment, 14 years imprisonment. And then we had the Nigerian Act being signed into law, whereby now if you associate in Nigeria or if you attempt to marry in Nigeria, you will get a sentence of between 7 and 14 years. And more tragically, individuals are the real victims of this. And we hear terrible stories of brave gay people who are caught up in the criminal law, killing themselves. We should never underestimate what suicide does or how many gay and lesbian people end up with that as their only option. But somebody that we were working with in Cameroon, his parents left him in such a situation that he died of neglect. The stories of... Our persecution and our oppression, the individual stories, must be told, and they must be told again and again and again. And it's the reality of our experience, which is why, ultimately, 
we will win this battle. It's why Peter was able to win so much on our behalf in this jurisdiction because the stories were told and told again and you cannot, you cannot hide away from the truth. You cannot hide away from the stories. So the global context is bleak. It feels very bleak. But then we have the great news um, on Monday of this week that Northern Cyprus, the legislature of Northern Cyprus, repealed their colonial legacy laws, the British colonial legacy laws. Um, They did it because there was a Strasbourg case against them, or there was a Strasbourg case against them pending in Strasbourg that would have forced them to do it, but they still did it, and they did it with a majority, and they did it with, not gusto, but they did it, they did it. And... um, (laughs) And so we are in a situation now where there isn't anywhere in Europe that criminalises sexual conduct between people of the same sex. We do, of course, have Russia that criminalises our identity. But we should acknowledge our achievements and know that now there is nowhere in Europe, there is nowhere in North America, there is nowhere in Australasia that does criminalise sexual conduct between people of the same sex. So as well as feeling the new year started in a very bleak way, I think there is also optimism. Thank you. I'd like to start by, first of all, paying tribute to the true heroes of this struggle, Russian LGBT people and their straight allies. Can you please join me in giving a riotous, loud cheer of applause? I think all of us are here tonight to stand in solidarity with all Russian people, LGBT and straight, who believe in democracy and human rights. We're here to stand with them and to support their struggle. They are leading the fight. We are here to support them. Um, This campaign is not about hate. It's about love. We're responding to the hateful homophobia of the Russian state, and I'm sad to say, a fair proportion of the Russian people, with a message of love. We love Russia, we just hate homophobia. We want to see a Russia where every citizen has the right to freedom of expression, where every citizen enjoys democracy and human rights, whoever they are, wherever in Russia they live. So this campaign is about the principle that love will always win. Hate is a temporary thing. Tyranny is a temporary thing. At the end of the day, love and justice will triumph. It may take some time It may take some time, but no tyranny lasts forever. In the end, equality, justice, freedom, and love do triumph. If I may be permitted to say so, I think there's an element here of challenging hypocrisy as well. I have it on fairly reliable authority that a significant number of Russian lawmakers who support the anti-gay law are themselves gay or bisexual. Now, I don't know about President Putin himself, (laughs) but I've got to ask myself, what is it all about this strutting, bare-chested on horseback? (laughs) Looks very gay to me. And of course, this is often the case in this country, in the United States, and so many other jurisdictions. The people who shout the loudest against homosexuality and LGBT rights often turn out later 
to themselves have been secretly gay. Self-hating, repressed, self-loathing, using homophobia as a cover to disguise and deflect attention from their own homosexuality. Now, I don't know if that's the case with President Putin or any other Russian lawmaker, but I think it's something we should bear in the back of our minds. The other thing I'd say is that it would be a huge mistake to focus only on the repression of LGBT people in Russia. Um, the Russian government's anti-gay law is just one fragment of a much wider attack on human rights and civil society organizations. Now, this repression includes the arrest of opposition leaders and the violent suppression of peaceful protests, state censorship of the media, the harassment of lawyers, journalists, and human rights defenders. So I think we need to frame this debate, this campaign, within the context of human rights for all Russian people, to build, if you like, a gay-straight alliance. And already there is an organization in Russia, the LGBT Straight Alliance, which operates precisely to bring straight people into the struggle for LGBT freedom. That really is the way to go. We need allies here, in Russia, and everywhere. Of course, in this debate, one of the most notable things about the defenders of the new law has been that they have claimed that the new law is solely concerned with protecting minors. They say it's all about pedophilia and unwanted sexual propaganda to young people. And indeed, I was shocked that even the great Russian conductor, Valery Gergiev, was quoted in Volkskrant newspaper last year in the Netherlands as dismissing the protests, saying this law was about pedophilia, not homosexuality. It is really fundamentally a propaganda by the state and its apologists to make this claim. They are using the fear of child sex abuse and paedophilia as a cover to try and justify what is a totally unjust law. Um, we've heard what the law says. Um, Russian law, in effect, criminalizes any public expression of lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender identity or any advocacy of LGBT equality where a young person under 18 might see it. Might see it. It specifically criminalizes anyone who suggests that homosexuality and heterosexuality are equally valid. It also says it's a crime, subject to these penalties, for anyone to make homosexuality sound interesting or attractive. And of course, this isn't just an attack upon LGBT people, it's also an attack upon straight people. Because if straight people advocate gay equality, if they say that it's okay to be gay, they will be victims of this law just as much as any LGBT person. Already we know that people have been arrested for holding LGBT equality signs in public or for publicly saying homosexuality is normal, even without any evidence that a young person under 18 witnessed it. Um, Russia's anti-gay laws are really an attack upon LGBT youth. I've got to ask myself, why do Russian young people need protecting from the reality and truth of same-sex love? The effect is going to be that they will be prevented from being told it's okay to be gay, be prevented from receiving affirmative, positive counseling and support, prevented from receiving HIV prevention information about how to have gay sex safely. This law 
is putting the lives of LGBT Russian teens at risk. It is reckless, it is irresponsible, and no government anywhere should treat its young people like this. As we've heard already, teachers are being sacked <coughs> simply because they're lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. The law is being used and manipulated for a much wider purpose than ostensibly it is said to characterize. We've heard about this recent reform. The legislators in the Duma who are proposing to remove the discriminatory aspects of the bill, or the legislation as it is. But sadly, this is not an improvement. This is a worsening because it doesn't repeal the anti-gay law, it merely extends it to all sexualities. So that young straight kids, if this amendment goes through, they'll be denied positive affirmative advice and counselling, safer sex information and so on. So I think we need to be really, really cautious about what this new proposed reform will actually say and what it will actually affect. As it stands, it, to me, it looks like a worsening of the legislation rather than an improvement. Having said that, whatever the law states, it is very clearly an infringement of the freedom of expression clause, clause in the Russian constitution. Russia's own constitution guarantees freedom of expression. This law violates that. Russia has signed up to the European Convention on Human Rights and has pledged to uphold its articles. Yet again, it violates the freedom of expression and non-discrimination clauses. LGBT rights are human rights. In this country, in Russia, in every country. We have a duty to support those people in Russia in the front line. And there are two very important things that you can do in the coming days and weeks. First of all, next Wednesday, the 5th of February, in London and other cities around the world, there will be a global speak out organized by All Out against the Russian anti gay law. We're going to be meeting at 6 p.m. in Whitehall, opposite Downing Street, next Wednesday, the 5th of February. The message is to the UK government, to the Russian government, and to all governments, press Vladimir Putin and the International Olympic Committee to uphold Principle 6 of the Olympic Charter, which prohibits discrimination. We really need your help and support to get the word out about this protest. It's taking place just two days before the opening of the Winter Olympics in Sochi. If we can get a big turnout in London and other cities around the world, it will help set the agenda. It will put LGBT rights in the media domain, in the public consciousness, in the crucial two days before the Sochi Olympics start. The other event to bear in mind is Valentine's Day, February the 14th. That day, a coalition of groups are organizing a protest outside the Russian embassy in Bayswater from 12 noon to 2 p.m. And we're sending again the same message, the message, love will triumph over hate. We love Russia, we just hate homophobia. For Valentine's Day, that's a really, really important message. So please spread the word about those two important protests. Come along, get your friends to come along. We need your help in getting out the word. The final point I'd like to make is about the role of the International Olympic Committee. Uh, Principle 6 of the Olympic Charter very clearly states that discrimination is prohibited, that discrimination is not an Olympic value. Yet the International Olympic Committee has already gone along with homophobic discrimination 
by the Russian government. Last summer, the Russian government announced that it would not allow the hosting of a Pride House at the Sochi Winter Olympics, a social meeting space for athletes and spectators like we had here in London during the 2012 Olympics. The Russian government declared in 2012 and again last summer it would not allow a Pride House. That is a clear, blatant act of discrimination. Yet the IOC has gone along with it. It has allowed Russia to get away with banning a Pride House. The other aspect of discrimination is that in the current climate in Russia, I'm almost certain that no openly LGBT athlete would be selected for the Russian Olympic team at Sochi. It's inconceivable they would allow an openly gay, proud athlete to represent their country at Sochi. That again is clear discrimination against Principle 6 of the Olympic Charter. And again, the International Olympic Committee has required no undertakings from the Russian government or Olympic Federation that it will not discriminate on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity when it comes to team selection for Sochi. So the IOC itself is absolutely complicit with what the Russian government is doing. And I think they really need to be called out. We need to tell them loud and clear that they are not honouring the Olympic values. Please go to the All Out website. It gives you things that you can do to protest around these issues. You know, it's just online activism, signing petitions, but it also gives you posters you can take to the protest on the 5th of February, even T-shirts you can buy supporting Principle 6. Go there, there's lots of information, and let's hope that we are able here in London to send a mighty message of solidarity to Russian LGBTs on the 5th of February and the 14th of February. We are all counting on you. Thank you. So we've heard from Kazania about the legal situation in Russia. We've heard from Jonathan about the broader global context and from Peter about the broader context of the Russian authoritarian state and the systematic discrimination against LGBT people in Russia. And we've also heard about (coughs) sources for change, uh, sources of redress, political pressure, demonstrations and activism Along with litigation, we heard about the current litigation against uh, this uh, American evangelical uh, under the Alien Tort Claims Act in the United States. And we've heard this very intriguing and surely unanswerable proposal, really, for an interstate claim under the European uh, Convention of Human Rights. So we've got all that on the table. We have uh, some time, not as much as I'm sure we'd like, but we have some time to discuss it. Who would like to... Kick off. Who will begin? Yes. I think I'm going to... I, I've got a feeling there's, there are going to be lots of comments and questions, so we might group them if you would like to start, and then if other people could catch my eye, I'll, I'll take your interventions next. Um, hello. As uh, Jonathan, you mentioned your talk briefly that part of this homophobia in Russia is like the attitude of the people, partly because like the concept of religion is so ingrained in Russian society and the Russian Orthodox Church has a clear position against homosexuality and partly because some of the regions in Russia, particularly the more distant ones, are so not developed that, you know, and the people are all quite conservative. Like, I think there's quite a lot of homophobia uh, among the people as a general and it's quite important to change that as well, as well as the legislation. And what do you think can be done to address that? Yes. Yeah, thank you. I have a question to Xenia. Um, up with the upcoming Olympics, what do you expect to happen? And are you going to use the, the global attention that uh, will be put on Russia 
And um, also, what do you expect from? Do you expect anything from the from the international community to to talk about these issues? And 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 yourself, are you going to sort of? Great. Thanks. Thanks. One more in this round, I think, over here. Hi, it was more of a general comment, really. Um, I attended a gay pride parade in St. Petersburg um, around April time last year. And uh, we actually found that there was very little resistance to it. Only one person was really quite actively against it. And I think this law doesn't really reflect what a lot of people believe. And in fact, it's our perceptions as UK people of what pe of Russian people do believe that is perhaps distorted distorting a lot of what we see and what we see in the media. And I hate the thought of having a negative view of Russia being sent from here. And I think this is a really positive, um, <laughs> positive event to have. And we need more of them, really, to focus on much wider areas and much, you know, much more people sort of being a lot more positive about our view of Russia. Jonathan. Okay. Uh, well, how, how, do you, how do you change culture? Well, I think the United Kingdom is, is a perfect example of how you change culture. Um, you know, in the 1950s, at any one point in the United Kingdom, there could be up to 1,000 gay men in prison um, for having engaged in consensual sexual acts. And so how do you go from that in the, in the mid-1950s to the situation now where almost we have full equality uh, and the answer, I think, to that is there's a combination of reasons why that happens. It happens through culture. It happens through a recognition. I mean, the, the, the civil rights movement is extremely important. It is thanks to rather brilliant people like Peter who, and the activism that he inspired in all of us. Um, and then there, there is, of course, the political element. And um, churches play an important role. And interestingly, the churches did lead the movement in this country towards, or they were part of the movement in this country, towards decriminalization. And so I think we need to kind of work with different cultures, different communities, different faith groups. But I think it is possible. I think you just need to look. I mean, this is the best example. You need to look at this country and how deeply homophobic it, it was and probably still is in, in many aspects. I think if you look at what our politicians have been saying right the way up into the, to the, gay, the, the gay marriage debate, and even at that debate too, you would have seen you know, the, the most foul language used um, describing fellow human beings. Um, and, but we're still here, and, we're, and we have this sense of our own uh, equality now. So I think it works on a number of different levels, but it's definitely achievable, and not only is it achievable, it, it will be achieved. Xenia, would you like to come in at the uh, Yes, yes, I can say uh, some words. First of all, I would say that um, me as a Russian citizen and a person with the Russian background, I don't think that um, there are a lot of persons in Russia, a lot of people who are against by themselves against LGBT people. Uh, the Russian people in general are not so homophobic as it could be imagined. Um, and I don't think that uh, homophobia is a Russian tradition. It's not a Russian tradition, obviously, as, uh, for example, we heard from some presentations. But uh, what is a problem is that the government, um, totalitarian government, use, um, right, use xenophobia as a method for uh, taking a power. Because uh, we have in Russia a problem of homophobia, pr problem of... Uh, uh, discrimination on the grounds of uh, nationality, for example, and it's uh, it's. But I think that uh, the source of this xenophobia is more the government than people themselves or culture, for exa for example. And uh, um, it was a question about Olympics and uh, what could international community do in this sense, and what what we are what we could. Uh, uh, suggest for, for the international community. Uh, I don't think that there could be any right answer on this question, but uh, I think that, for example, discussions like this 
today here. Uh, it's a very important step, and it's very important to uh, gather uh, brilliant people, brilliant activists together, and think about situation in Russia and situation around uh, homophobia and uh, legislation prohibiting so-called propaganda of homosexualism, and to uh, to to form creative ideas, new creative ideas. For example, such as the idea about uh, in, uh, about um, interstate complaints in the European Court of Human Rights, uh, because we, we we had already used many uh, many strategies and many tactics uh, in order to 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 do to do something with homophobia with the state homophobia, but we are not so successful yet. And uh, in Russia, we have a coalition of different NGOs, uh, the Russian coalition, and we have also a coalition with international NGOs. And uh, I know that many, uh, many events will be organized uh, in Russia and abroad. And uh, um, you can participate in this. And uh, believe me, for many, many Russian LGBT people and LGBT activists, it's very important that they can feel your support. And even for me personally, it's very important to, to be here and to hear uh, all your words and your inspiration and your uh, belief uh, in human rights. And thank you so much. And I think that for many people, it's also very important. Thank you. Peter, would you like to? I'll pass. Or pass? Okay. Other comments, questions? Yes, upstairs in the front row, please. Anyone else has comments and questions? Please Hi. catch my attention. Hi. Um, I, I, I just have a question as a general question, which I think the panel's already touched upon. Um, I was wondering. Um, what precisely, and I guess any answer will be quite speculative, is motivating these kind of anti-gay legislations? Is it because of Putin's personal homophobia? Is it because of kind of trying to reinforce a family unit? Is it, is it a um, attempt to realign the state with the church? I mean... <laughs> The panel talked um, a lot about how um, the, there was like almost a step back for the LGBT movement globally with what's happening in India and in Russia. But in a lot of like countries, there has been a huge movement forward with the legalization of gay marriages and with, um, I think, in many ways, the family unit being undermined with what's happening in France right now. So, like, politically... I guess the question is, what is precisely like driving these forces with homophobia? Is it because I think it's probably much more of a broader strategy than just an attempt to gain more power for his personal gain? That's it. Great, thanks. There was a question. Yes, in the middle at the back, please. Hi, um, I'm Russian, and I, it's more of a comment than a question, really, but just something that I kind of wanted to cite, a conversation that I've had very recently, a phone conversation that I had with my friend who is Russian and still lives in Russia and has been in a gay relationship for quite a few years now, still is. And I'm, with, with you know, with all the discourse, the international discourse lately, I've asked her, well, naturally, what do you think about all this? Is it, are you affected? I personally, I've lived in London for the last five years, and so I'm not around uh, for, you know, when it's happening in Russia. So I asked her, what do you think? Are you affected by what's happening in Russia? Do you personally feel discriminated against or repressed? And she said, no, not at all. We're absolutely fine. And by the way, I'm not from Moscow. I'm from, there was a question earlier about, you know, some of the smaller regions or the smaller towns in Russia where people think homophobia is more prevalent. I'm from a smaller town in Russia. And they, that's where they live as well. And I said, no, we don't feel that at all. And I asked her, well, how do you feel about everything that's happened on the international level as well and the um, reaction by the international kind of audience. And she said, and I thought that was actually very interesting, and she said, well, as a Russian, I'm actually getting a little bit annoyed. And I think this is, um, I think what this is saying really is that I think the international reaction is very well justified, and personally, I, 
I'm as, as a Russian, I'm very much opposed to the laws that we're discussing today. And I think it's important to point out again that homophobia is not a general Russian sentiment at all. And I can assure you that there's lots of people who still live in Russia or live outside of Russia, but are Russian who are very much opposed and disapprove of these laws. And I, I think what happened was these laws were actually in some way uh, imposed on the Russian public, really. And I think the caution here is that I maybe... When we talk about these laws, it's important not to actually say that it's a general Russian sentiment at all, because I think what it does, it gives the Russian politicians who actually created those laws an excuse to then try and unite the Russian public against those international attacks and further promote the Russian traditions and the Russian spirit as us against them, really. So those laws and the international reaction is becoming, is really giving them more power in a way to then unite the Russian public against uh, the, the international audience, really. So... And then one more from the next round. Hello. I've just uh, got a couple of quick questions for um, Ksenia, actually. The first is um, you were talking about sort of an increase in the climate of um, fear and hate crimes and that sort of thing. Um, so we're hearing the effect that this is happening on the victims, but what about the attackers? Are they being held to account in any way or are they sort of able to get away with, with what they've been doing? Um, and the other thing just picks up on that other point. I, I wonder if you could just comment briefly on what role you see the international human rights movement and international human rights institutions um, playing in your own struggle um, for LGBT rights um, in St. Petersburg, so at, at you know, quite a local level. So to what extent do you find um, sort of the international um, uh, level of participation helpful? Great. Um, Peter, would you like to react to any of those comments or go straight to Xenia? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Xenia, so, would you uh, like to respond? Yeah, yeah. yeah I can. I, I, I can. I can. Um, there was a question about what happened with attackers, and uh, sometimes we cannot even obtain investigation of uh, committed crimes. But sometimes uh, investigation, uh, there is investigation. Uh, there is court proceedings, but uh, attackers uh, found guilty, but in um, just in general crimes, sometimes motivated by hooliganism. We have this conception, do you know what is hooliganism? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, but not uh, courts and uh, investigation bodies, they, uh, they don't um, recognize these crimes, uh, these acts as hate crimes. Um, and what about uh, the role of international human rights institutions in, in our local battle? Um, it is a source of, of inspiration for us. It is a source of legal battle, actually, because, for example, uh, I'm, I'm trying to use international standards, the European Court of Human Rights standards in local courts, in some time, and sometimes, uh, sometimes it could be possible, but... In most cases, of course, not. But then uh, we can go to the European Court of Human Rights or to the UN uh, treaty bodies. And uh, basically, uh, it is the main source for us, the main forum, legal forum, when we can prove that we are on the right side, that uh, this law is discriminatory, that the Russian government uh, violates uh, human rights of LGBT people and LGBT human rights defenders and so forth. Uh, yeah. And uh, there was also a question about uh, uh, political source and, uh, and reason for, for, adopt, uh, for, for adoption of these uh, laws. And yeah, as I said, I think that uh, it's a symbol of totalitarian government and uh, it's about regulation of sexuality in general. And uh, we have... Uh, Apart from uh, no, from a home legislation, we have, for example, restric restrictions on abortions. Um, we have uh, restrictive legislation um, on women's rights. Sometimes we have uh, restrict restrictive legislation on freedom of assembly, and it's only one piece of general trend towards totalitarian state, probably. I was of two minds to bring up the lively um, experience or lively trip around Russia because I, I think it makes you sound slightly sort of paranoid about U.S. evangelicals and um, 
I didn't really want to come across in that way. But having heard what our colleague from Russia said, maybe, it, maybe those sort of individuals turning up and spreading their poison are more important than, than, than and they are having a bigger impact than really we do give them credit for. So they are able to undermine what may have been a more traditional Russian approach. Uh, Ksenia talked about it earlier about it being invisible, and therefore, if that was the status quo in the, uh, in the 2003, um, and then you get somebody like Lively turning up in 2006 and just sort of you know, slipping this poison into the discourse, and then it takes root, and then it kind of exponentially explodes into what has happened. Maybe that is, maybe that is what happened. Maybe lively, the U.S. evangelicals are more responsible for this, um, and they just do need to be properly held to account for for their actions. Do you see their influence elsewhere in the world? Oh, definitely, absolutely. I mean, you know, certainly around in the Caribbean and in um, and in in, in in Africa, and it's it's as if they sort of feel, or well, they state this, they they feel they've lost the battle in the United States, so they'll go elsewhere and um, and seek to win there. Um, The motives for the new anti-gay law and repression are varied, but I think one element is political advantage. It's a bit the way in which the Conservative Party in this country in the 1980s used homophobia as a way of attacking and undermining the Labour left and shoring up its own base of, of support by focusing on the other, the different, the enemy within. And in, perhaps Ksenia will correct me, but you get the sense now that the public vilification of LGBT people in Russia is uh, an echo, not the same, but an echo of the kinds of Nazi propaganda against the Jews in the late 20s, early 30s. Uh, there are no concentration camps yet. There are no Nuremberg-style laws um, in Russia today, but the public rhetoric and propaganda of the state and far right and even some extreme left groups in Russia, uh, like the old Communist Party, it, it does have those echoes. It, it's, it's almost like deflecting attention away from the real problems, you know, the way in which the oligarchs have seized and stolen state public assets and enriched themselves and often come here to London as a, as a safe haven for their stolen riches, um, a distraction from just all the other problems uh, about you know, wages, working conditions, um, ethnic tensions, <coughs> environmental degradation. Very conveniently, LGBT people in Russia day, today are the enemy within. The, the, the state is making them the focus of attention, which very conveniently takes attention off all these other big problems that the state is not addressing, or indeed problems that the state itself is actually complicit in. Wonderful. I think we have time maybe for one or perhaps two. Yes. Actually, I think the young lady in the back row and then... Thank you. Good evening to everyone. Hello, Ksenia. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Russian, and I would like also support Ksenia and previous Russian girl speaker who was talking that homophobia is not Russian tradition or some sort of things like, like that. Um, historically, uh, Russia is a very conservative country, and of course, um, some sort of uh, not traditional sexuality, some sort of thematics is not very like modern in Russia and it's quite like, you know, it, it should take some time that we can find the way of how we can work with it. And my question is linked to um, all of you. I would like to have some comments from you, all of you. Um, why you specify mostly in gays and lesbians and some other kind of non-sexual um, traditional uh, sort of, I mean, sorry, people. Um, why, uh, I mean, uh, um, Russian law system is not perfect, and as we know, human rights in general is um, not supported. What about just gen uh, people, what about the people in general? Okay, thanks. Thank you. And then uh, one more at the back. Oh, actually, no, sorry, you had your hand up earlier, didn't you? Yeah. Would, could you be really brief? Yeah. 
and then at the back. Um, so my question would be, oh, so after the Olympics are over, without the Olympics as a tool for international attention, do you think it will be harder for LGBT yeah. activists in Russia? Yeah, my question is mainly for Ksenia. Um, I'm just curious about your view uh, personally and sort of a, a general comment on LGBT um, groups in Russia on the calls for boycott, tribal boycotts, and other economic boycotts of Russia in connection with this issue. Uh, and also any advice that you might want to give to LGBT travelers or sympathizers coming to Russia, how they should or shouldn't behave given the current laws. Um. Great, thank you. Ksenia. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, about boycotts, uh, uh, you know, LGBT activists are very different uh, and there are some groups who support boycotts, uh, there are some groups who, uh, who don't support boycotts, uh, boycotts of, of Olympics game also. And uh, uh, my organization and me, we, we, we think that uh, we think that, for example, Olympics game, uh, Olympic Games could be uh, an important uh, platform for discussing the problem. Therefore, it could not be very productive to boycott Olympics. But at the same time, different different types of strategies could be fruitful. And there is, uh, we are for uh, diversity, and we are for diversity of methods also. Um, about the question about um, people who people who are going to Russia, right? Yes. Uh -huh, travelers. Uh, I think it depends. Uh, if I can give you some advice, it depends on how radical are travelers. Because uh, if you want to be safe, of course, it could be better not, for example, not to demonstrate your feelings towards your partner, for example, publicly, because uh, you, can, you can find some troubles from part of uh, radical groups, uh, neo-Nazis and so forth. But if you want to change something, probably you can try to do it and to be uh, prosecuted uh, as a propagator. Oh. Uh, and then probably when uh, international, when a foreign person uh, will be uh, prosecuted under the law, it will became uh, it will became an uh, interstate issue actually, not only the, the issue of uh, the Russian Federation and probably uh, some international pressure will come from 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 the consulates or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Great. And it, it was the question also about uh, people in general. <laughs> uh, it's a common question. Uh, we are for human rights in general. Uh, our organization coming out. We are for human rights. But there are some people who are LGBT people. There are some people who are people with uh, disabilities. There are Roma people, etc., uh, etc. Et and. For example, LGBT people, they have, uh, they faced with specific kind of oppression, uh, specific kind of discrimination, and sometimes there should be, uh, should be methods and uh, ways to protect these people. But at, this, but at the same time, uh, coming out, for example, we, we, uh, we also use some strategies that could contribute to general human rights movements. For example, this year we will uh, protect um, LGBT activists who were uh, arrested uh, at one uh, street event. They are LGBT activists. They were arrested. And then... Um, the court, state, uh, the court stated that these people are not guilty, and now we are trying to uh, sue the government and ask for uh, for moral damages, uh, compensation for moral, for moral damages. And it's about uh, it's about LGBT rights, of course, but it's also about uh, human rights in general. It's about freedom of expression and freedom of assembly, and we are trying to to develop strategy for uh, protecting uh, civil rights activists uh, and human rights in general by doing this. Great. Final comments from either of our panelists here. Well, I mean, once the Olympics are finished, I think 
people will be even more vulnerable than they are now. Um, and I think that's why, um, well, I mean, f f thankfully there are brilliant people like Ksenia and Polina are all out who have very good strategies, but I think the international community also needs to have a strategy. I think we should look at all the tools in the international toolbox. I think we should be looking at travel bans. All of these things should be being considered about how do you put pressure um, to help protect the human rights of the gay and lesbian communities in, in Russia. And I go back to the point, I think a state that condemns Russia should, from Europe should be brave enough to hold Russia to account before the European Court. I think people are right to be anxious about what will happen after the Olympics are over. Obviously, President Putin and his government are currently on a charm offensive, trying to reassure everybody that uh, you know, gay people are not persecuted, that this law is not targeting or harming anyone, it's just about protecting kids. Well, that in itself is an extraordinary tribute to both the Russian activists and the international movement, because before, Putin wouldn't have even addressed these issues. The fact that he's under such pressure has forced him to make these statements, uh, and the fact that he has been so defensive is a sign of the strength of the movement within Russia and internationally. So I think we need to be really um, mindful that we have already achieved something in that we've got the Russian state to address these issues. Not satisfactorily, of course, but at least they are engaging or attempting to engage, however flawed their arguments and justifications. What I would say is that um, one thing that we could think about in consultation with Russian activists is um, applying the Maginsky law. Um, Sergei Maginsky was um, arrested tortured and killed in Russia after he exposed the massive theft of state assets in corrupt business dealings. He was even put on trial posthumously. After he was dead, he was put on trial and found guilty. Um, now, in response to his murder, um, activists, Russian activists and allies in the West have framed what's called the Manitsky Law, which is in honour of Sergei, um, which does seek to impose things like travel bans and asset freezes on Russian officials who are implicated in human rights abuses. Um, it's never been tried or applied with regard to LGBT rights abuses yet, but it has been passed by the US Congress. Um, there is talk about it being passed uh, in the European Parliament. Um, and I think that um, that is possibly a way to go, because in the day, what these very rich, powerful Russians really fear is the inability to move freely, to come to London, to New York, to Berlin, um, to have their assets and invest them in other countries, to be able to um, play the international markets. Um, so anything that can impact upon their finances and their travel and freedom of movement, that will have a really big, significant impact. It may not stop the outrageous abuses, but it might reduce them and it might make some of these people think twice. So a British and European version of the Mitski law, I think, is something we should consider, of course, in consultation with our Russian friends and comrades. Well, we've had a really illuminating hour and a half, I think you'll agree, uh, helping us to understand uh, the context, nature and proportions of this situation and the particular combination of political pressure, transnational moral support and legal action that is needed uh, to address it. Unfortunately, this is all we've got time for. I'd like, uh, before we finish, to thank... Uh, the organisers, in particular Chris Thomas, uh, my colleague from the Law Department, and also Bradley Barlow from the Law Department, and Andrei Kushinov uh, from the Centre for the Study of Human Rights, who've helped to put on this event. But most of all, of course, I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Peter Tatchell, uh, Jonathan Cooper, uh, and Ksenia Kirichenka in particular, 
uh, for joining us uh, from St. Petersburg. And uh, please join me in thanking uh, our speakers and the organizers and also in wishing Kazenia well uh, in her incredibly courageous and massively important work.